Um, there's also been a huge amount of talk um, over the last couple of years about uh, this notion of tech hubs and agronomics where you can put a number of people who all do similar things and um, uh, are, are creating uh, similar things into the same place um, in order to kind of learn from each other. So this is a, an article that was in Wired magazine about uh, what is colloquially known as Silicon Roundabout. So this is just down the road from Future Learn. Um, at Old Street Roundabout, that is where a lot of startups have all gathered. Um, and it's now being supported by the UK government in terms of the Tech City Initiative, so they are trying to create what has started to happen as a kind of grassroots movement. They're trying to put in things that will help support that and build um, London's Tech City. Um, and I think in terms of, from FutureLearn's perspective, we fairly early on decided we had to be based in London, that if you were going to hire a lot of great web developers really fast, um, then being in Milton Keynes, which is the Open University is based, would not um, be a, a way to do that very quickly. Um, and so I think this kind of shows this sort of, this kind of agronomic stuff. So in thinking about it though, I thought that actually um, a lot of these things that I have just talked about, MOOCs are perfect to kind of replicate in a kind of online way. A lot of this stuff is about sharing ideas um, from people who are leaders in their field and then other people talking about it and discussing it and sharing those kind of things. Um, so I think, and I think that in, in terms of a blended way, um, we, it, it can potentially remove some of these sort of barriers of geography and so on that lead to things like the necessity of everyone gathering around a, a dirty roundabout in East London. So, social learning. So this is uh, fundamental to, um, to future learn, and basically the idea is that the courses are a way for uh, leaders in their field to share their ideas and inspire a debate amongst the community. Um, and the idea is that everyone in that community can come away with a, a better understanding of it. So uh, there was a course we ran recently on um, Inside Cancer, where there were people that had, uh, that were, leading researchers in the cancer field. There were people who were medical students, there were people who were practitioners in hospitals, and then there were people who either had cancer themselves or knew somebody who was uh, affected by cancer. Um, and this led to an amazing exchange of kind of ideas and so on, um, and that um, some of those researchers came away saying, I've learned something new from this because of that interesting social mix in the community. So the the content is effectively the kind of campfire around which people gather. Um, so our platform allows you to put videos and articles and other ways of communicating ideas online. Um, and this one is not related to the, the web field, but I think it's uh, a really good example of um, what we mean by storytelling. So I'm just going to show you a very short clip. conference marked a new beginning, the League of Nations was to provide the framework for the new world order. For the first time in history, the nations of the world would unite in a world organization. At the time, not everybody was enthusiastic. Now this is one of the iconic photos of the Paris Peace Conference. It shows the four political leaders that determined the fate of the conference in many respects. Clemenceau from France, Wilson from the United States, Lloyd George from Britain, and the Italian Prime Minister Orlando. Now these four, Wilson was the main supporter of the League idea. Wilson was adamant that there must be a League, and that this League would be the centerpiece of the Paris Peace Settlement. The British government went along, but Lloyd George was more ambivalent. And Clemenceau famously said that he liked the League, but he did not believe in it. But the momentum for setting up a world organization was enormous. League of Nations associations had formed in many countries, and they were preparing draft proposals. The great caravan of humanity is once more on the march, wrote the South African General Smuts in his practical proposal, a pamphlet that became the blueprint for the League. And it's yet in the center of Paris where it all happened. Most of the discussions that led to the adoption of the Covenant took place over there, just 10 minutes at the Place de la Concorde, in the Hôtel Crillon. And the first meeting of the Council of the League of Nations 
took place just over there in the building with the two flags, which houses the foreign office of the French government. So this was a clip from um, a course that um, is about the uh, peace conference that ha happened in um, uh, 1919 that began, formed the, the basis of uh, a lot of the kind of um, uh, international co cooperation that we see now and so on. So the, the interesting thing about this is that uh, it really starts to bring the story to life because he goes to the places, he points out places and so on, um, and he takes you on that journey. Um, now, that's partly, I think, where um, there is this perception of, like, MOOCs can cost lots of money. A lot of the video content does um, uh, have uh, quite um, high production costs. This one was produced in collaboration with the BBC, and I'll come on to talk a little bit about partnership and how I think that can, uh, can benefit this area in a moment. Um, this one is uh, a, a much... Um, th this one is from the uh, Begin programming course, and so this one has uh, uh, less kind of... Uh, um, expensive production value, but it shows what you can do with a green screen and a really nice creative idea in order to create uh, engaging content and is obviously kind of much more relevant to the subject area that we're looking at right now. Welcome to the Good Program. I'm Carsten Stavankis, and I'm your guide in this course. In this course, we teach coding a little bit different than normal. Normally, you will learn a simple concept, use it, and then another simple concept, and use that. The problem with that is it's quite boring. I learned that by myself, and uh, I did find it boring, so I should know. But what we do here, on the other hand, is that I have created some code. That code will give you a ball in the middle of the screen on your mobile phone. We will then teach you the concepts using this code and build up this game that we will have after seven weeks, each week. That's probably enough to give you a flavor, but I think it shows like how that lovely kind of 8-bit idea uh, can just make it quite engaging in terms of like that, uh, how do you get people to go from week to week and so on. It's, it's not kind of frivolous, it's actually really important in terms of like kind of getting people to kind of stick with it and so on. Um, this shows the, how the, the kind of social stuff works in practice. So every piece of content, um, the other thing I should say is that Rindu could probably tell you more about that course uh, if you're interested. Um, uh, so this shows how the, the social stuff works in practice. So every piece of content allows you to, um, to add comments and discussion around the side of it. So this putting it kind of front and centre um, was very kind of important to our kind of design of the product. You can also introduce kind of set piece discussions at any point that you want to in the, in the course. Um, this shows our, our peer assessment, uh, sorry, peer review tool uh, that allows you to um, add assignments and other um, uh, learners can give you feedback on that. Um, this one was quite interesting from um, a course on presentation skills that the Open University gave and so people record, recorded talks that they uploaded to YouTube and then they posted a little description and a link to the YouTube clip um, and it was actually really successful in terms of people getting feedback from other learners within the community on how they could improve their presentation skills. Um, so this is the discussion that happened after the, the assignment and so there's Chris at the top here who um, sort of worries about this style of presentation being quite new to him, um, but then thanking another couple of learners for their, their, their feedback. And then, because he, they, he's obviously got some nice feedback from them, um, he then posts the link again and then gets a bunch of feedback from some other people as well who give him some other tips and so on. And so I think that kind of shows how, kind of, um, how this kind of thing can be really powerful in terms of that social learning bit. Um, this is a profile page, so we, are, we have the kind of architecture that most social uh, networks have, so you, you, every, every person has their own page where they can say a bit about themselves, you can see which courses they're doing, you can see all of the conversations that they've taken part in, so if you click on someone's face you can see a bit more context about them. We also have this concept of following, so that you can find that people that interest you and follow them, and that allows you to make sense of the massive discussion by filtering conversations just for the people that you're interested in. We also have like buttons, and this is again what I mean about uh, how we are borrowing these conventions that are, are very commonplace online, that allows you to see the, the questions or the comments that people are finding the kind of most useful and 
again, the, the uh, discussion areas can be sorted so you can see the, the most light things. Um, we also don't have a down button as well, which is also quite important in terms of the kind of uh, sense of community and celebration that is part of that product vision. Um, we try wherever possible to encourage the use of other web tools. So this is a, a bunch of things that people created on that uh, uh, creative coding course. Um, and this is a Flickr community, that, um, a Flickr group that, where all these images have been posted from. So we try and integrate as much as we can with the canvas that is the web. And so we encourage people to use things like GitHub and Stack Overflow that I mentioned before, or Android support uh, community and so on, which is, if you're a developer, then actually learning how those tools work is also a very important part of the learning. Um, so then I think there's, there's potentially three challenges that we have around MOOCs, um, and I think it's worth noting at the moment that it's, it's a very young area. As I mentioned, we're, we've only just celebrated our, our first birthday, so we are very much uh, working things out, and our university partners are very much uh, having moved from a point where they were scrambling to just make some courses and now beginning to think, I think, more um, strategically and thoughtfully about those courses that they make and why, why they might make them. Um, so I think the first one is about the relevant courses. So um, we have got a number of uh, really interesting courses on there that um, uh, can help people in this field, like if you're beginning to start a programme, if you're looking at some, some kind of quite complex things around um, uh, how to analyse data, we have kind of courses like that. <coughs> but, but actually I think there is, um, a lot of these are very academic in flavour um, and uh, so therefore are not necessarily aimed particularly at people like myself and where you might need some more kind of practical hands-on skills. Um, and so I think um, that's one area where we might need to sharpen up the kind of offer that um, MOOCs can bring if we are going to bring real uh, change and benefits to this area. Um, I do have some suggestions for how that might happen. I'll come on to those in a moment. Um, the second one is funding. Um, so we've been doing quite a lot of thought recently um, as we are moving from this uh, phase where we are in the um, where our partners are doing this from often centrally funded pots of money that are about innovation and about new things and so on. So how does that move into the faculties where are the places with the money to make this part of business as usual? Um, and this is something that we're, we're finding quite a lot in terms of how, on that sort of classic hype curve, how do you get past the, the sort of uh, the hype bit to, through the uh, trough of disillusionment and onto the plateau of productivity or whatever, you know, you know the yeah. graph that I'm talking about. Um, so these are some of the things that we're, we're kind of actively exploring in terms of like how do we show the benefit to our partners and so recruitment is obviously uh, something that they're quite interested in, showcasing research, um, how do they support um, on-campus blended learning and so part of producing uh, courses as MOOCs, you can also run them on campus, um, one that um, Southampton ran which was an archaeology one on uh, the uh, port in the, the Roman port near Rome, um, Portus. Um, they're going to be running again um, alongside their um, undergraduate degree because of all of the, the interesting insights that you get from the outside world that their students can benefit from. Um, as a catalyst for uh, digital transformation is often cited and lots of uh, our partners are now saying lots of things are changing on their campus because of the fact that they're running MOOCs with us that are not necessarily related to MOOCs. Um, Corporate sponsorship is quite an interesting one, and we've started to dabble in a few spaces, and I'll show some of those in a moment. And then there's the revenue from premium services, and um, so um, we, we are already offering our statements of participation, but there's various other things that we've got in the pipeline where we give some of that money back to our partners. Um, these, though, in the area of how do we support web skills, I think are probably the more interesting ones. Um, so student recruitment is probably not one that fits particularly well here because um, I think the report showed that most people uh, who, are in, who are interested in web skills either have a degree or they don't want one. Um, and so actually recruitment is probably not a great return on investment for university partners in this area. Um, showcasing research possibly, but again in this area maybe less so. There might be certain things where getting out some of the research into industry and so on might be interesting around big data or those sorts of things. Um, 
but again, it's probably less relevant in this area. Um, and possibly less so the digital transformation bit. However, like running some of these courses um, alongside existing computing degrees and so on, I think might be a really interesting way of adding a kind of different dimension uh, to them. Um, corporate sponsorship, I think, is a really rich area because actually, obviously, as we're here, industry wants these skills and to, to have things that they can help uh, their existing employees learn, um, but also how they can recruit potentially new interesting talent is, is again, quite interesting from a, a business perspective. Um, and then revenue from premium services. So if these things start to get recognised, and I think this um, is brings me on to my next point, then learners are much more likely to want to buy them. And I think the report also said that people were probably quite willing to pay a small um, amount for these services as long as they were recognised by employers and they got them a job. So the third one, I think, is recognition. Um, and so we need the courses that we are running, I think, to start to be recognised by businesses and employers um, and the people who spend the time learning to be recognised for the skills that they've learned on those courses. Um, and I think that's beginning to be the case, but I think there's more that we can do in order to, to help that. Um, which brings me on to what I think might be the solution, which is something that we take quite a lot of pride in at Future Learn and are doing a lot, a lot of work to extend what we already do, which is partnership. Um, so, we are rooted in partnership. We, we started with 20 university partners, and so that's been very much at the heart of how we do things um, all along. Um, but as well as having our 37 university partners, that we also have people who provide content, we have uh, uh, businesses that provide expertise and real world problems and potentially money. Um, and we think that these are the things that might um, might really help. So there's a couple of examples of these. So this is the course that we're running on cybersecurity at the moment. It's going to run once every quarter. It's uh, co-produced between the um, Open University and the UK government. And the UK government are really interested in this because they want as many businesses as possible to understand some of the threats around cybersecurity and employees in those businesses to know to be much more au fait with uh, simple things like uh, password security and all of those sorts of things. So, um, uh, this is a course. How am I doing for time? I've got a few clips, so I can show clips. You see, or I can skip over them. Um, so this is the this is the introductory video. Hi, I'm Corey Doctorow, and I'll be your guide through this eight-week course, catching up with you each week to recap on what we've covered and how it relates to what you'll be learning during the week. I used to be the European director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. That's a campaigning civil liberties group in San Francisco that, among other things, legalized the use of strong cryptography around the world and continues to be involved in a lot of important struggles. I'm also a visiting professor at the Open University and I hold a doctorate, an honorary doctorate in computer science from the OU. At the start of the course, you'll learn the basics of information security and how to take some easy steps to secure your digital life. We'll then begin to look under the hood, exploring some of the technologies underpinning the internet and information security. You'll see how data moves between computers over the internet, how it can be attacked, and how it can be kept secure. And what if you are attacked? We'll also be looking at ways to deal with the aftermath, as well as steps you can take to prevent any future attacks from being successful. But so you get the idea. Uh, so that's, yes, Corey Doctorow who is kind of fronting that course, um, but there's some really interesting conversations going on between people about their different perceptions on it, how it relates in their business and so on, um, and that those statements are beginning to be recognised by those businesses that 